Wow. <clears throat> you know, when we face God, there's going to become some questions. One of the questions is, listen to this. Um, the author of this book, the Bible, is God. He authored it. And he wrote it. What did he write it for? He wrote it that you and I could take it and learn by it. And learn how to live by it. And learn how those that originally started with God, what their mistakes were, that we don't make those same mistakes. Now, uh, informational uh, speaking like this right here, right now, is not necessarily overly interesting to many people. But are you going to stand before God and say, I read your book? Look at this. Let me let me read a little thing, a little excerpt in my uh, Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. And uh, because of the author, which is God, he said, often God is thought of as the creator, the redeemer, the shepherd, the judge, with correct thinking, of course, for he uh, does indeed function in all of these roles. But there is a great accomplishment of God which is almost always left off the divine attributes of the list compiled by men. And this wonderful but forgotten role is the author. God has written a book. And that profound and precious book is the Bible. The B-I-B-L-E, the little song we learned when we were children. Oh, the B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I'll stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Wow, woo, wee. And, and testify to by any human author that the nicest thing one can say to an author is, I've read your book. Woo, isn't it going to be nice to stand before God and say, I read your book. And, received as much as I could out of it. There are many things that I didn't receive because I didn't know how. But it's tragic, but true, and a fact that many Christians who will someday, alone with other believers, stand before the judgment seat of Christ, will be sadly forced to admit that while they were saved, by heeding the salvation message out of this book, God's book, they nevertheless uh, fail to take the time to read it. It's too, too busy doing other things. Too busy. If I took all of the time before I got saved, if I had took all the time that I smoked cigarettes and had been reading Bible, I would have read the Bible through a dozen times. So we do things that instead of reading the Bible that we could do and read, be reading the Bible. So if for no other reason, the Bible should be carefully read to allow the believer to proclaim to Christ on that day, Dear Jesus, there were many things I didn't do on earth that I should have done, as well as other things. But one thing I did do, I read your book. <laughs> Woo! That's going to be nice to be able to proclaim that. But if you haven't read his book, you don't have the power that you need to live a Christian life. You, it's in his book. Because of the often repeated command to read it, it all the way through it, it's this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein, this book of the law, day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Joshua 1 and 8. Let me tell you something. I'm a paint contractor. And I went to a big plant one day, and we're going to paint the floors. And we walk in there. We have no idea what direction anything is. So we get this directional sheet. And this directional sheet gives you arrows. And said, this is north, and this is south, this is left, and this is right. And, and these lines go here, this color. And there are lines that go here on the floor, this color. 
and there's a stopping place here where the uh, machine comes through and you put the arrows on the floor on both sides and then you put a stop there and you paint these things on the floor. That was a directional. And that was a big plant. And we knew nothing about it until we got the directional. Once we got the directional, we had to find out where we were. What department are we in that we put these on the floor? What color goes in this department? What color goes in that department? What color goes where? And so you'll know where you are. The green department is one thing, and the blue department's another. The red's another. The yellow's another. These areas are different things, but they're all on the same floor. And they all work together. Well, this is the Bible. That's just like the Bible. The Bible is compartments. And it's compartments of different things. And it's all put together. And when you study it through, you get the end of it. You know how to look down on it and know where you are. Study to show thyself approved, a workman unto God. Need not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 but he answered and said, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that came out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4.4 4. And then we see especially to be noted is this last verse. Jesus said every word. Jesus is responsible for every word in this book. Because the Bible is God's chosen way to accomplish his divine will on this earth. And he's going to do that. Sinners are saved through the message of the Bible. Nobody has ever been saved without the message that comes from the Bible. And so whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How shall they call on the name of the Lord if they have not believed? And how shall they believe if they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Except they be sent. As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel, and the peace, and bring glad tidings, and good tidings, uh, and have not obeyed the God, and have obeyed all the gospel. For Isaiah saith, The Lord who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And this is what I'm doing. I'm speaking the word of God so that you can hear it. And I'm, being, I'm, I'm going to be in Genesis chapter 9 when I come back into the book. Right now I'm doing an exploratory uh, expansion of what we're doing. But Peter, standing up in the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea. And all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words, Acts 2, 14. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts, and said unto Peter, and unto the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? <coughs> That's a good question. If you're asking that question, you need to follow this thing. Acts 2, 37. Therefore they were scattered abroad and went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people were one accord, gave heed unto those things which Philip spake. Wow! Hearing and seeing the miracles which were did. For unclean spirits who had cried out with loud voices came out of many and were possessed with them, and many taken with palsy, and uh, were lame, were healed, and there there was a great joy in the city. Acts 8, 4 through 8. By the way, Jews did not go to Gentiles. Jews did not go to Samaria, except that God sent them. And Jesus went to Samaria. The disciples wouldn't even go in there. They walked around. And Jesus walked up and sat down on a well. And a lady came and he said to her, uh, Give me to drink. And, and she said, Well, you have nothing to draw with. And, and he said, I, and He was the water of life. 
He said, if you'll ask me, I'll give you water that you will have forever. And the, the conversation went on and she was saved. And she went back and brought all the men of the city. And Jesus showed that he had a great deal of uh, uh, pity for everybody in the world. Everybody. Everybody. Of his own will begat us with the word of truth. That we should be a kind of first fruit of the, 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 the creatures. James 1 and 18. And he made the city of Samaria be a first fruit in that area. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. 1 Thessalonians 4 and 3. One of the biggest, probably in this day, right now, one of the biggest uh, sinful things that's going on is free sex. And that is fornication. The Bible said that's fornication. You are not to do that. You are to be monogamous. You marry one woman and one man. That is God's plan. One woman and one man. Not jumping from cover to cover, place to place. That is not God's will. If you are a Christian and you delve in such a thing and you are a Christian, you will be under such great conviction and just hope that God don't give you AIDS or something like that for your actions because he can do that, you know. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking heed thereunto according to the word. According to the word. With my whole heart have I sought thee, O Lord. Let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy words have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. That's Psalm 119 and 9 and verse 11. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto these words, lest thou be reproved thee, and thou be found a liar. Proverbs 35 and 6. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, whatever you ask will, you ye will, what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. John 15 and 7. And now, brethren, I command you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Acts 20 and 32. Listen, our enemy, the devil, he knows the Bible. During the account in Matthew 4, Christ is tempted three times. And on each time, each occasion, the Savior answers Satan in this phrase, it is written. And, and proceeded to quote from the word of God as found in the book of Deuteronomy. But what is almost always overlooked is the fact that the phrase, it is written. He says it four times here in Matthew. And then on the fourth time, uh, the devil, using a, the quote of scripture to Christ, noted the, the background of his point. Then the devil taking him up to a holy city and setting him on a high pinnacle in the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, now he's quoting Bible, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Matthew 4, 5 and 6. Here Satan quoted Psalm 91, 11, and 12. It is taken completely out of context to be sure. But how did Satan know about uh, in that in the first place? The answer is painfully obvious. 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 <laughs> One day, when the devil had nothing better to do, he must have sat down and studied Psalm 91. Many Christians today have probably never even read this psalm. But the devil apparently has it memorized 
Thus, he needs to read God's word. God's word lets Satan get an advantage over us. Paul, the apostle, gave us an example. One of the examples he gave us is the greatest Christian that ever lived is Paul was. His spiritual accomplishments are nothing short of staggering. Uh, he was a man who made the first three missionary journeys, who founded the and pastored the first 50 of more Bible-believing churches who wrote over half of the New Testament and on five occasions saw the resurrection of Christ and at least once was actually caught up under the third heaven itself. Uh, but then he was ar arrested, condemned to death, and placed in prison. Note carefully his final words, to Timothy just prior to execution. Wow. Here's the greatest uh, evangelist that ever lived, Paul the Apostle. And he's going to pass down to Timothy for he, Timothy's uh, ability to see how he needs to go and do. He said, for I am ready to be offered. He's ready to die. And the time of my departure is at hand. But I fought a good fight. Wow. I have finished my course. Wow. I have kept the faith. Wow, wow, wow. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Wow. Do you know that crown will be worn forever? He will have that forever. He will be a shining light in heaven. Paul the Apostle will be one in heaven. You'll know immediately when you see him. He is, was close to God, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not me only, but unto all them also to love his appearing. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee, and the books, especially the parchments. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8 and verse 13. Look, Paul was a human being just like everybody else. He needed his cloak. He was in a cold prison. What were those parchments? They were his copies of the Old Testament scrolls. The point to be made here is, is that in spite of his marvelous achievements in the old apostle, still felt he could profit from studying the Word of God on the eve of his death. Here's a guy going to die the next day, and so, and he wants to read some Bible. Wow. I tell you what, when you get full on, when you get a problem, when you get in trouble, when you, your mind is caught up in trouble, open up your Bible and read. Grab your Bible. I keep a New Testament in my glove compartment. I keep one on the seat. I keep a Bible on the seat. I have a Bible in the back seat. When I open the back flap on my wagon, I have a Bible back there. I have Bibles everywhere. That, uh, should a moment approach me that I'm having a moment of a decision that's a problem maker, I open the Bible and read something. Just read something out of the Bible. It's better than taking an aspirin. <laughs> it's, it's better than a Tylenol. It's better than any, any kind of medicine that's made today. The Bible will do it. Where did it come from? And God said, let us make man in our own image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowls of the air, and over the cattle, and over every living thing that creepeth upon the earth. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Genesis 1, 26 and 7. Know ye that the Lord is God? It is he that hath made us. And now we ourselves, we are his people. And the sheep of his pasture. Psalm 100 and verse 3. <coughs> Wow, we need to observe that. Why am I here? Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. 
Ecclesiastes 12 and 13. If you want to know the duty of man, go to Ecclesiastes and read 12 and 13. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Revelations 4.11 Where am I going? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever Believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. John 3, 16, 18. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Wow! And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Psalm 23, 1 and 6. For now, but whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Woo! There will be no opportunity to ply 1 Corinthians 10, 13 in heaven. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. But will with the temptation also make a way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. There will be no temptation in heaven. All temptation is for our earthlings. And uh, so look, let's quickly go to the B part here. There will be no opportunity to apply John to C part. There will be no opportunity to apply Philippians 4.19 in heaven. But God shall supply all your needs according to the riches in his glory in Jesus Christ. Philippians 4.19 In heaven there will be no need. There will be no opportunity of applying John 14, 1 through 3 in heaven. Let not your heart be troubled. Be, uh, you believe in God, believe also in my Father. My Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and where I go, there you may be also. In heaven, there will be no sorrow. There will be no opportunity to apply Psalm 23, 4 in heaven. Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. These are Bible verses that you know, we have in the Bible because the only ultimate proof of our faith is the Bible to introduce the eight and final reason for studying God's word, to follow um, an imaginary situation is, is the purpose. Often the unbeliever hurls the following accusation at the believer. Oh, you Christians, you're all alike. You're so dogmatic. You think alone and right and everybody else is wrong. How can you possibly be so sure that you, your belief is true? Well, I got an answer for that question, and that is, we're often asked in a uh, scoffing manner, is nevertheless a fair one. How does a child of God know his faith is only and the only one can be accepted and correct? Let us suppose that you are invited to an important social function in your hometown. Attending this gathering uh, are people from all over the world. As the uh, introductions are beginning made, it slowly draws upon you that the only professing Christian there is yourself. You are subsequently introduced to a Buddhist, a uh, Confucius, a Shinduist, a Muslim, and other individuals, all uh, belonging to various non-Christian religions. After the pleasant dinner, the conversation gradually turns to the matter of religion. Your hostess realizes that subject 
to be of general interest suddenly announces, I have a wonderful idea, since anyone here seems to have a great interest in religion. May I suggest that we share with one another by doing the following, each person will be allowed to speak uninterrupted for 10 minutes on the subject, why I feel my faith is the right one. Well, a group quickly agrees with the unique and uh, uh, idea, provocative. Uh, then with a warning, uh, she suddenly turns to you and exclaims, you go first. <laughs> There's the Christian guy. He's got to go first. All talk immediately ceases. Every eye is fixed on you. Every ear turn to pick up your first words. What would you say? How would you start? Let us quickly list a few arguments which you could use. Uh, you can't say, I know I'm right because I feel I'm right. Christ lives in my heart. This, of course, is a wonderful truth experienced by all believers, but it would not be convincing to the Buddhist who would doubtless feel that he was right too. Two more little excerpts here. You should say, I know I'm right because Christianity has more followers in the world than any other religion. This is simply not true today. Actually, the sad truth is uh, evangelical Bible-believing Christians is a distinct minority uh, in the world today. The Muslims would doubtless quickly point out that, that to you that you can't say, I know I'm right because Christianity is the oldest of religions. Ultimately, of course, this is true. But the uh, Confucianists might... Uh, counter that uh, by presenting his teaching centuries before Bethlehem. Since of that course, he would not understand the eternal existence of the Lord Jesus Christ. This then argument could not be used. What could you say? And really, do you? what would you say? Have your uh, disposal only a single argument? But that argument, that weapon, used in the right way would be more than enough to overwhelm and convince any honest and sincere listener at the uh, social gathering. That wonderful weapon that unswervingly argument is one's own personal copy of the Bible. What could you say? Well, you could hold up your Bible and confidently proclaim this following. Look at this. I know I'm right, because the author of my faith has given me a book, which is completely unlike any of the books of your faiths. It could then continue until your time ran out, by pointing out the unity, the uh, indestructibility, and the universal influence of the Bible, you should discuss its topically, scientific, prophetical, accuracy. Uh, finally, you might relate exciting examples, perhaps of the greatest single proof of the supplemental nature of the Bible, that it is marvelous, life-transforming power. Of course, it must point out neither the Word of God nor the God of the Word can be scientifically analyzed in a laboratory test tube. The divine creator still desires and demands faith on part of his creation. See Hebrews 11, 1 through 6. But he has presented us with a heavenly textbook to add us this needed faith. In fact, the Gospel of John was specifically written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through him. Wow. Well, this has been a fairly long drawn out 29 minutes 
here every 30 minutes time I close out uh, explanations why why should we get in why should we get in and if we get in where will we be well I can tell you where I am I was headed for hell and probably would have died before I was 31 and God turned me around now I'm 78 headed for heaven and God has given me the health the ability and the strength to get up and do this thing on the YouTube that others may be able to have it perhaps I'll be dead and in the grave by the time you see this because when this is on here it's on here permanent and they'll be here Lord willing uh, uh, all the way to the day that everybody goes to heaven maybe used in the thousand year reign because it's all going to be the truth this Bible is going to be the truth in the thousand year reign just like it is now in this reign that we're living in and this reign that we're living in is going to end pretty soon and when it does wow this book tells about it I got I've got <laughs> who are we I got right here in front of me would be another 30 minutes talking fast as I could to get through it but we're going to call this a, a, a rat right here and it's been good to be with you and we'll see you next time right bye bye what I do what I do what I do what I do my fingers are shaky